Let's all stand this evening, everybody. Praise the Lord. Good to have you tonight with us in the house of the Lord. Good to be with people that we love and appreciate and uh, be back in that Lord's house one more time. We love everybody. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate those from home joining us tonight. God bless everybody there. And um, just, just excited. It's a new year. It's, um, it's an opportunity. And we're, we're not looking back, amen. We're just going forward in Jesus' name. We may not be going 100 miles an hour, but we're going forward. We're just, you know, one step at a time. And that's how we're going to do it, y'all. That's how they got to the promised land. They just went one step at a time. And uh, we, just, we just keep going by the grace of God. And uh, we're excited about it. Appreciate you. Appreciate Victor Tabernacle and all of our precious church family. Amen. Brother Justin's teaching tonight, so uh, we're going to let him come on up and uh, teach the Word of God. He always has something very special and precious to say. His spirit is so sweet and tender, and uh, I just I just appreciate that. He's such a blessing to this church, him and Sister Rachel and, and all the Wilsons and all that family. So thank God for them. Thank God for y'all. I think it would be good for us just to tell the Lord we love him tonight. Just some, say something to the Lord good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the house of God, people of God. Thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you for the word, God, that's going to come to us. Lord, you're going to encourage somebody. You're going to speak to somebody, Lord, tonight. You've anointed him, God, to speak the word of God. You're going to use him to bless somebody tonight. Father, let, let everybody listening, God, be blessed, I pray. Let everybody listening receive something from you, God, tonight. Let us take part in this word, Lord. Let us apply it, Lord, to our lives, our hearts. Help us to grow from it, Lord, and grow by it, God. Anointing, let your anointing rest upon Brother Justin to be a help and a blessing to us tonight. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord God. We bless you. We thank you, Lord, tonight. Amen. Amen. Come on, Brother Justin. We love and appreciate you, man. Take your time and preach to us this word of God. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I always appreciate the opportunity from God to fulfill my calling and the opportunity that pastor shows his appreciation to me and my family. It means a lot to us. You know, it's one thing to, to feel you're appreciated. It's another thing to know that you're appreciated. And I, and I appreciate that. And I feel it from all the church family here and all those that are not. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, before I get started, uh, my, my grandfather, who is 76 years old, he's, he's got COVID, and they took him to the hospital last week and put him on a ventilator. He's, he's, doing, he's doing better, but he's not 100% yet. He's still on the ventilator. They got the ventilator cut down to 65%. His vital signs are still strong. So just pray. You know, we've been praying and fasting, me and my whole family. So keep my, his name is Tony Zuniga is my grandfather's name. Keep him in, my, in your prayers tonight, please, for, for a speedy recovery. You know, he, he was, he was uh, God's moved miracles in my grandfather and my grandmother's life, and this is just going to be one more that we get to testify about. So I just want to, I just want to ask everyone to remember him in your prayers. So let me, let's go to Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. It says, And Abel he also brought of the firstling of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and they shall rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. In verse 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelled in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. 
you may be seated. Tonight I want to come to you from the title, Yes, I Am My Brother's Keeper. You, you know, sometimes, sometimes as human beings, we get so caught up in making sure that we're right and our ways right that we, we inflict damage on other people. And we have to, we have to make sure that, that we, don't, we don't do that because if we, if we do that, if we, if we come and get disagreement with our brother and we rise up against our brother, we're in a dangerous place. One of Satan's most powerful tools that he has at his disposal is division. And, and, and it's, a, it's a natural thing. Division's, division's natural. The animals even do division. That's what the lion does. If you watch a lion or a bear hunt, that's what they do. They, they divide the weak from the strong, and they attack the weak. We don't need to be accessories into the helping of the division. We need to come together under unity and under God. If God gives us a plan and God gives us a purpose, we need to make sure that we're unified in that plan and in that purpose. Now, the Bible doesn't give a lot of explanation uh, about leading up to this, you know, other than we know the, that Adam fell and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But somewhere along the line, there was instructions gave. And one brother f- followed it and one brother didn't. And that's some to blame on the parents' fault, Adam. Because Adam evidently didn't take the time to make sure that what he was doing was right and showed them the difference between right and wrong. So Adam, again, failed in his part as a leader. But that doesn't mean that, we have to, that, that he, they have to stay that way. Just because Cain's condition was against his own self-interest and his own actions, that doesn't mean that you have to continue on in that way. Just like, just when, Cain, just like when Cain killed Abel, God gave Adam and Eve another son, and that was Seth. And in that new, that new birth came a new bloodline. And that's, if you go back and you trace it, that's where Jesus' bloodline comes from. So we don't have to live in the same way we come from. Just because we come from that doesn't mean we have to continue into that. And that's where we need to find ourselves renewed in God. We have to renew ourselves in God daily. We have to move forward in God daily. When, when there's instructions give, we have to follow those instructions. And that's where men come into division with each other. We argue over what we think is right, what our opinion is. When God gave us instructions in the Bible to follow, and that's where men have, that's where we've fallen as men, as we don't take the word of God literal no more. We, we, we pick and choose what we want, and we tear little bits out and say, oh, I want to follow this one verse, but we don't put into context what it's saying. And that's what division causes. We need to follow God's word because God's word doesn't divide, it unifies. God's word puts together what the devil tries to destroy. But if we're not careful, if we are not careful, we'll, we'll pick on each other and we'll divide each other and we'll get so consumed with making sure that we're right that we'll forget the conditions of our own heart. We'll forget the conditions of where we're at in God. You know, we, we, we could wind up like Cain if we're not careful. And how and, and we, we'll say, well, we don't murder nobody. I'm not going to go out and murder nobody. But what we do is we kill the spirit in our life. We let our flesh rise up against the spirit and destroy the spirit. And that's, that's been with me for the last two months. Is God, don't let my flesh rise up against your spirit, God. Don't let my flesh get in the way of what you're trying to do for me, God. Because it's so easy. It's so easy to let the flesh just rise up and take over. And before you know it, you don't even, you're like Samson. You don't even notice that the Spirit of God is not around you no more. You know, you, you know God because you can hear God when he, when he calls, and you call God and he answers. But if you're not careful, you'll miss the anointing of God and not even realize it's gone. You won't even realize it. Because we let our flesh rise up against God's Spirit. But... Let me go to Luke chapter 13, verses 25 and 27. Uh, Chapter 13. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door and yet began to stand without, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto them, I know you not whence you are. Then they, 
Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drinking in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. That I looked up what that meant in the Greek. The workers of iniquity means you're, you're a false character in act or deed. You're portraying to be something that you're not. That's a worker of iniquity. Cain was portraying to be something that he wasn't. He was portraying to be a man of God. He was portraying to be that he was going to follow God's will, but he wasn't going to do that. If you look on the day that Cain's born, Adam says, God has given me a man. If you look on the day when Seth was born, they said they begin to call on the name of the God again. Those are the difference between the two men. One was proud that he had a man. The other one was a man of God. That's what we have to strive to be. We have to strive to be the men of God. We have to strive to be the people of God. We have to be the sons and daughters of God. Just like Seth established a new bloodline, we're the bloodline of God now. We're the bloodline of Jesus now. We need to start calling upon the name of God. We need to cut this. To, the world divides enough, and division is running rampant in our world. And we need to cut that out in the name of God. We need to unify. If anybody can be unified in a time of division, it's the church. If anybody can stand when the world won't stand for what is right, we will. We will. You know, it's it's sad because I, I remember it a little bit, but there was a time where it didn't matter. If you went to church or not, you believed in God and you believed in a moral character. To some degree, that's being lost. No one, the, the foundation of God and the family has been eroded. And there's nothing, there's nothing in common with that no more. That day and age is gone. And that's why we need to stand for that. We need to stand for that moral compass. We need to stand for that, that unity in God. But we shouldn't rise up against each other while we do that. We, even, even, if the, even the people that don't agree with us, we shouldn't rise up against them. We should not cut them down. We should show them a more excellent way. We should, we should be that light as Jesus was. In the, middle, in, in, that, in the middle of captivity, when the Romans, and history shows the Romans were some of the most brutalist captor, you know, captivity, could put people under captivity, Jesus still said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And give unto me what is mine. That's where we should be. The world wants to do worldly things, let them do that. But that doesn't mean we have to take part of that. But we should still give God what is his. We should still do what God says. Let me go to James chapter 4 verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and do it not, to him it is sin. And I used to say, well, you know, God, you know, I mean, I, I, I know what the lake of fire, what it says all those people are going to be in there. But what this, I had a little bit more enlightening, is what this is saying is if you know that you should be doing something and not doing it, it's not just a list, it's your personal walk with God. If it's not where it should be to you, that's a sin. If you don't care no more than your walk of God to let it die and walk away, that's a sin to you. You know, a gardener doesn't, plant a garden and let it, the weeds overtake it. Just like when God gave us our spirit, he didn't expect us to just let it go back to sin. He wants to see us bear something. He, he's coming to check his fruit and asking us where it's at. We can't let sin corrupt that. And sin, and when sin comes into our lives, we're going to have to reject that. It's not a sin to be tempted, which I know everyone knows that. It's not a sin to be tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. So how much more will I going to be to face temptation? But it's how I choose to deal with that temptation. Do I follow my own interest and my own will like Cain did? Or do I rise up like Seth and say, no, I'm going to do God's plan? Janet, let me go to Genesis. I'm going to go back to Genesis 4 and verse 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, Abel, who Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. They called his name Enos. Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. It's important to reference here the bloodline 
Because at this moment, God is preparing a way for us to be with him. At this very exact moment, this is a part where sin tried to destroy, but yet God prevailed. You know, it's, it's the nevertheless attitude. Sin comes and tries to destroy, but nevertheless, God, your will will be done. It doesn't matter what the world tries to do or what happens. We are going to end in the outcome where we are victorious. It doesn't matter what happens. So I, I tell Satan tonight, is, yes, I'm my brother's keeper. I'm not my brother's judge. I'm not my brother's God, and I'm not my brother's deliverer, but I am my brother's keeper. And I come from verse, uh, from the Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 10. This is where, this is where it comes. It's, it's a pure of heart issue. It's where your, where is your heart? Are you as Sadducees and Pharisees pointing your finger at somebody, or are you Jesus looking for seeking that which is lost? Because there's, you're, there's offenses are going to come. People are going to get nasty at you when you try to tell them that what they're doing is not right. But I, I will say this. If you stand for God and you don't waver, they'll respect you more than if you turn the other way. They'll, st- they'll, they'll respect that. They may say, I disagree, but they'll respect you more for that. It says, Brethren, if a man overtake in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest they also be tempted. That's exactly what happened to Cain. Exactly what happened to Cain. He let his jealousy and his own interest overtake the right way of God. What would would be a different story if he would just talk to Abel in the field and say, you know, let me do what you do. Let me learn from you. You know, somewhere I missed it down the line. But instead he rises up and kills his brother. What a difference that would have been. We should bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We're all, we're all nothing. We all nothing. We come from nothing and we'll leave with nothing. You know, I never, I've never seen a, a U-Haul follow a hearse. So whatever, whatever, we, whatever we do in this life, the only thing that matters is our walk and our condition with God. That's the only thing that matters. And we have to be good, good stewards of our hearts and good stewards of our mind for God, with each other also, not just for ourselves. Go back to verse 2, please. Bear ye, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's an old Roman battle position and it's, it's basically it's called the turtle. And what they did is when the Roman legions come under attack from arrows, they would link their, their full shields together. And the man in the front would link them together with the man in the front, and the man in the back would put them over so they could advance on the enemy so the arrows wouldn't matter, or the arrows wouldn't attack. You know, the Bible says that the, the devil shoots fiery darts. The reason why he shoots darts is because if a lie was set in front of you, you could confront it, but it has to gain momentum to get to you. But you, if you have your shield of faith, and my shield of faith is linked with pastors, and then his is linked with other people, we can advance on the enemy, and there's nothing he can do about it. But we have to be able to be unified together. It's one mind and one body, many members, but we're one. But we're one. Just, and they used it for something that wasn't good. They used it for their own personal or their own personal desires and lust. But the, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing that can still be applied for us. If we link together and we push together, there's nothing that can stop us. There's nothing that we can't overtake. And that, and that's a thing too. We don't we don't fight the devil on his terms. We fight the devil. By what God says to do, it, which is spiritual. We don't fight cardinal with cardinal. We fight it with spiritual. That's why Paul says, I die daily. Because that way there's nothing left for Satan to use against you. Because you're daily renewed. Go to verse 5, please. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. But be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whosoever a man soweth, that shall he also reapeth. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
And let us not be worried in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. As we have therefore an opportunity, let us do good unto all men, not those that think like we do, but to all men. Let us do good to all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. We should be more excellent to one another. We should show one another more favor. We should show one another more patience. We should be like God was to us. That's what we should be like. And I know, I know that you're going to think that, uh, just let me finish before you uh, think what I'm going to say. So I was at work this morning. And there was, you know, big potholes and mud everywhere. And it came to my mind, am I, like, am I like that pothole? Am I like that mud hole? Every car that went by it, it touched it. And whatever was in that pothole that was muddy on white cars and every other car, it took with it. And am, am I do, what does people get from me when they come across me? Do they get my attitude? Do they get my division? Do they get my spirit? Or am I showing them God? And do they take God with them as they go? That's what I, that's what I was thinking this morning. I said, God, let me, let me be more like you, God. Be, let me be more like you. Because, you know, there's, there's things that go on at work that I don't, that I don't partake of. But if I could just change one person and that one person can catch fire with somebody else and it can grow like it never would be able to grow before because one person made their mind up. We need to be like that. We need to be a spiritual pothole. We need to be a spiritual pothole. When, when someone comes across us, they shouldn't leave the same again. They should be, something should be different. They may not be able to put their finger on it, but it should drive a hunger in them. They should come back asking for questions. You know, that's, that's, the, that's where I want to be at with God. I want to I be where I can be used by God like he says. So Cain... Cain was a, a bad example of being my brother's keeper. So I want to talk about Joseph. And this is a good example about being your brother's keeper. The more and more I, I study and I read my Bible, I'm, I'm a really big fan of Joseph. I, Joseph and Joshua. I love Joshua because Joshua, if God said it, the next, next sentence, Joshua's doing it. Joseph, it seems like no matter what happened, nothing could shake his faith. So in Joseph's story... His own brethren try to kill him, try to destroy him. But little did they know that that pit that they put him in, there was a blessing in that pit. Just like each and every one of us, there's pits and there's dark days in our life, but God is in that pit. God's with us. It doesn't matter what the pit tries to destroy. If God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Sin and drugs try to destroy me in the pit and try to throw me over, but God said it wasn't going to happen. Yes, I had to go to jail. Yes, I had to go the long way around and spent three and a half years on probation and do all the jump through all the hoops and stuff. But where I'm at today, I wouldn't trade it for nothing because that was the blessing in the pit. I couldn't see that eight years ago in a jail cell, but I can see it now in God that when I was there, God was there, and I didn't even realize it. I didn't even know what God was doing in my life. But little did I know, when I, when I come out, and I'm sure Joseph felt the same way. He felt betrayed. He felt, my own fam, one of my own family members turned, me, turned against me. And, uh, you know, I felt betrayed, and, and I'm sure Joseph felt like that. Felt like the, the whole world was against him. Felt like if my own family ain't with me, who's with me? You know, you think about a little 12, 13-year-old boy. You know, it wasn't like, you want to go to Egypt, let's go. And they had him, you know, and they was giving him food and it was a party, you know, down to Egypt. I'm sure they had him tied up to the camel and being drugged across the desert. It wasn't a pleasant trip. But when he got there, God already had a preparation for him. God already had Potiphar there for him to go into Potiphar's uh, house. And, and, and we know that Potiphar's wife tried to lie on him. But Joseph said, I won't sin against my God. I'm not going to do this wicked thing that she wants me to do because I'm not going to sin against my God. Right there, Joseph made a decision. Doesn't matter what happened, God's promised me something, and I'm going to hold on to that promise no matter what happens. I'm not going to give up, and I'm not going to give out. So make the long story short, you know, he gets thrown into prison because Potiphar's wife lies on him. So the, he interprets a dream from Pharaoh, gets out of 
the uh, get out of prison, and then Pharaoh makes him second only to him. And not only did Joseph save his brothers and his family from the fed famine, he also saved the Egyptians, which Egypt represents sin. And I've, I still ain't figured that one out how Joseph saved sin, but Joseph Joseph done that because Joseph saved Egypt. And when and with and that just shows you when God gets on the scene and when God has a plan and purpose, nothing's going to stop that. Nothing's going to stop that movement of God. And he, God's not going to stop it in your life. God's not going to stop in the next. You know, when we're with God in heaven, we're going to take part of that with God too. Just like Joseph was taking part of something he didn't understand, we are going to. I just I don't understand it all, but all I know is I want to be there. I want to be with God. Because I've seen what God has done in my life, and I still continue to see what God has moved in my life, and no one can convince me there's not a God. You know, it, it, I don't know, it aggravates me so much when I hear atheists and other people talk about, well, why do you believe the Bible that, that was written by man? And I say, anything you've ever read is written by man. The only difference is, is God was part of this. So why is it so hard for you to believe one book, but you will deny all the other books? And I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. When you have such such history and documentation, not from just one source, but from multiple sources, who Jesus was, the Bible is real. Why would we not live by that? And everything everyone's searching for, and they're trying to fight it politically over, the Word of God will give it to you. It's freedom they're looking for. It's liberty they're looking for. But they're trying to find it by their own way. They're not looking at it through God's eyes. And I'm here to say that you'll never find true peace and happiness until you start living it God's way. And I will say God's way is not always easy. It's hard. It's hard to look at yourself in the mirror and deny yourself and put your own flesh in check. That's, that's a hard walk with God. You know, I used to have a, a hard time. I felt like God's people were, were submissive all the time. And, and, and God, God showed me that, is it submissive to deny your own self? Because that's strength. To tell yourself no and deny yourself, that's strength. To say, God, I don't want to do my will, I want to do your will, that's strength. That's not submissive. That's making a stand against something. That's, that's putting your faith in something that's real, that's bigger than yourself. You know, people feel such a connection to sports because they feel like it's bigger than them. And I think that's why people idolize sports because they're looking to something that's bigger than them and they're looking at something that they feel like they can belong to that's the family of God and us as a church we have to do that we're going to have to 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 open up our arms and say come and join me let me show you what I know you know and I'm going to tell on myself a little bit we we went to Sam's Club after church Sunday and uh it's about three weeks ago and a guy asked asked for money and I gave it, me and my wife gave it to him the, about three weeks ago. Well, that same guy was there again. And he, uh, he come up to me and asked for money. And I said, no, I was like, I'm not, you know, you told me the same story before. I was like, you know, I know what you're doing. And, you know, I don't appreciate it. And uh, we left. And, man, did I ever feel convicted when I got, when I got back home. And I said, why didn't I tell him, why don't you come to my church? Why don't you stop doing what you're doing and come and give God a try like someone did, did for me? And, and I, I, I missed an opportunity there. And if I see him when we go back, I'm gonna, I, he'll probably think I'm after him because I'm going to chase him down if I see him. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite him to the house of God because I, I've been there and I've seen that and I know what he's doing. And that's where I've been at. And I, and I, missed, I missed that opportunity, but that's, that's okay because I, I learned from that opportunity and that's what matters. And that's where, that's where we have to be at in God is we have to be able to move forward and learn from our mistakes when we make mistakes with God. Because people change, but God never changes. And the way we deliver might change and the things we might try to change, but God's message is still the same. God's message is still real and God's message is still relevant. And that's where we have to be at. But I want to talk about... Just like in verse chapter uh, Genesis chapter four, verse sixteen, when the Bible says that Cain departed from the presence of God and went to the east of Eden. Sometimes when we are in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, sometimes when we get a dry spell 
in our in our walk with God, we feel like the presence of God has departed from us. We we the, we don't we as Pentecostals don't like the silence of God. But that's why we should come to church. That's why we should be at the house of God. Because I might be going through a dry spell, but Pastor Dale's not going through a dry spell. Or Brother Shannon's not going through a dry spell. And we can gain each other off that. We can gain uh, each other's blessings off that. Because in a, in a time of dryness, that's one of the most dangerous times you can be at. You need to surround yourself with good people. You need to surround yourself with a good brother's keeper. You don't need to surround yourself with Cain because he'll leave you out in the field and only one will come back. So, and and you don't, we don't need to take part in any of that. But we need, we need to be in a spiritual place with God where we can help one another and we can learn from one another because that's the only way we're going to get it. It's, the Bible says that we edify each other. And, and the Word of God edifies us and we edify each other. If we can't edify each other, if we're not learning, we're stagnant. And that's, that's not a good place to be at in God. So when the silence of God comes in our life, don't get aggravated. Don't get annoyed. Just stop and take a moment and say, God, what are you trying to teach me in the silence? What are you trying to do in the silence? Because it's like when, it's like when trials and temptations come in our life, we get mad at the storm, and we get aggravated at the storm. But the storm brings water, and water brings life. And without that storm, without the rain, there would nothing ever grow. And that's the same thing with us. It's like the old Andre Crouch song. If we never had a temptation and had it trust on God's word, how do we ever know that God's word would be true? How do we ever know that God's word would be real in our life? Because those are the little pieces that no one can ever take from you. You know, the government might come and try to take the Bible or whatever. People's going crazy right now. It doesn't matter what man tries to take from you. If you have God in your heart, they can never take that word from you. They can never take your testimony from you. Satan, you know, Satan took, God let Satan use all, take all those things from Job. But the one thing that he never could take from Job is his testimony. Because he said, I'm not going to charge God foolishly. Foolishly, he blesses and he gives. He gives and he takes. And you know, we have to be like that with God. That our testimony is what we have in God, and we should never let that go. We should never let the seed of doubt take away our testimony because that's what's going to keep us going, and that's what's going to move us forward in God. Because it will be a sad day when no one speaks of the Word of God no more because they don't know it. What a sad day that would be. And I refuse to let myself be like that. I refuse, I refuse to let that happen. God's been too good to me, and I know God is real. No one can ever tell me that God's not real because I've seen God move in my own eyes where no, no, there's no way anything else could be, and God's moved that way. There, there, there's nothing that could change my mind on that. And I want, I want to share my experiences because I, I'm a firm believer that your testimony if you're real and you're honest with your testimony, no matter what it is, that's what's going to get people's attention. No matter what it is. No matter if you come from the gutters like me or you're like my wife and you've never known the taste of alcohol or what a cigarette's like. God, God is still God on either way. God, God has the power to keep you and God has the power to clean you up. God has the power to do any. Whatever you need, God has the power to do that. So whatever walk of life that you come from, let, let God use you in that walk. And I want to encourage everyone here tonight, and I'm coming to an end, I want to encourage everyone here tonight to be your brother's keeper. Not your brother's judge, but to be your brother's keeper. Bear one another's burden and keep each other unified together in prayer. Thank you, guys. Amen. Let's all stand, man. That was some incredible teaching right there, everybody. That was good right there. I'm telling you, that'll put, that'll put meat on your spiritual bones. And you know what it really can make you do? It can make you do some self-inspection. Makes you think about yourself a little bit. Remember he read the verse that for a man, if he thinks him to be something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. There's a lot of deception out there because there's a lot of folks think they're all that and they ain't really... We're, they're not really all that. Amen. And then he mentioned this verse in uh, Galatians 6 and verse 2. 
bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, um, th this, this, is, this is a very powerful verse if you think about it. The, the, Paul is equating bearing one another's burdens with fulfilling the very law of Christ. So that's not something that we should minimize. That's not something that we should take lightly. If Paul says this is how important this is, you're going to fulfill the law of Christ by bearing each other's burdens. That ought to tell us how important our brother and our sister are or should be to us. Come on, somebody. It ought to tell us how important brothers and sisters are to us. You know what? Preach is good when we preach about uh, uh, loving everybody and, 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 and all, but I'm going to tell you how, how really that is supposed to play out. That's supposed to play out and be, be manifest on our, on our lives when we do more than just talk about going through something with a brother and sister. We should go through something with a brother and sister. Does that make sense? It's easy to talk about it. Talk is real cheap. But when a brother or sister is going through the battle of their life and they need somebody to pray for them or to be in their corner, that's when the church should be in their corner. They shouldn't have to make 50 phone calls trying to find somebody that will pray for them. Something touched my heart before service tonight. And I thought it was the, felt like it was the Lord getting my attention a little bit. One of our sisters praying earnestly in the prayer room, very sincerely, very very passionately. And I knew there was a burden in that prayer room. I knew it. I felt it. And I believe it was the Lord. And then Brother Justin preaches on the very same thing about bearing one another's burdens. You know, that's, that's one reason why we, we, we're the household of faith, the people of God. We have the same royal blood in all of our veins, and we're called brothers and sisters, right? Because a, a brother is born for adversity. Brother is born to help you to go through things that you're going to go through. So thank God for the word tonight. Amen. Thank God for the word tonight. I don't know. I don't know if it did for y'all what it did for me, but I believe the Holy Ghost was talking to us tonight. We can be a blessing. We, we can be a help. Just in, and Brother Justin didn't know this, but Pastor Dale taught in this very subject. Well, we used some of these verses this, this past week. Amen. Cain and Abel and... Just very, very similar. So the Lord is speaking to us, everybody. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the people of God. Thank God for you and you being part of the church with us tonight. Amen. Remember your giving to the church. Remember your financial obligations to the work of God. As you as you give, you know you're blessed for doing that. And the Lord will, will help you to do that. If you do your part, he'll sure do his. Remember at home tonight, all your, your giving, if, if you're able to send in what your, your obligations are, we're so grateful to that. Thank God for you. Amen. You're dismissed tonight in the name of the Lord. We'll see you back at 10 o'clock this coming Sunday. Yeah, we're going to get just put the offering plate up here, Brother Shannon. If y'all can help us tonight with something, we appreciate you doing that. The Lord will bless you. We'll be back here at 10 for Sunday school, 11 for worship this coming Sunday. So thank you for joining us tonight. I pray that you've been blessed by it. If you get a chance... Let Brother Justin know how he's blessed you tonight. Amen. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. God bless you all. Buddy, have a great week, a safe week, and we'll see you back Sunday. Amen.